Well, thank you, Dareth, and good morning, everyone. It's good to see all of you here this morning, here in the Worship Center or watching live online on our YouTube channel. We are absolutely delighted that you have come to worship with us this morning. If you happen to be visiting with us this morning, we are, of course, absolutely thrilled that you have come to worship with us, and we invite you to visit our welcome table at the end of the service. You'll find, <clears throat> excuse me, you'll find that table in the foyer behind you. Some, someone will be there to greet you and present you with a little blue bag, the contents of which we know for sure will be a blessing and an encouragement to you. Just a few announcements this morning. If you happen to be on the missions committee, there is a missions meeting this coming Thursday at 10 a.m. and your attendance is vital. So if you're on that committee, please plan to attend this Thursday at 10 a.m. And then on Wednesday, December the 9th, is a church membership meeting. Wednesday night, December the 9th, 6 p.m. Presentation of the 2021 budget proposal and the slate of 2021 committee nomination. So if you're a member of First Baptist Church Sun Lakes, we encourage you to attend that evening. There are copies of the 2021 budget proposal in the foyer on the table. So you might want to pick one of those up if you haven't done so already. And then Women in Focus is having their bridal shower on this Tuesday, December the 15th. Bridal, did I say bridal? Well, well, if you stop and think about it just for a moment, bridal shower in this group makes more sense than baby shower. But you're right, I did make a mistake. It's a baby shower, and that's going to be on the 15th at 9.30 a.m. You can contact... Um, Pamela or Gail Jones, or I think, um, I don't see her here. So, or sign, there are sign up sheets in the hallway out here in the foyer uh, behind you. And we encourage you to sign up so they'll know how many are coming. If you haven't picked up the December edition of our newsletter, The Good News Chronicles, it's also available out in the foyer behind you. And let me remind you of the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. It's our uh, Southern Baptist offering that we have at Christmas time supports international missions, missionaries all over the world. And so that's our emphasis between now and the end of this year. Before Pastor George comes, let me make mention of something that's kind of important. Vivian Johnson, right here in the second row, this coming week has a birthday and she will be 99 years old. I checked with her a couple of weeks ago to make sure it was okay to mention that she was going to be 99. And she said, of course, I'm proud of it. <laughs> and, you know, all of us who have been here for quite a while, we've known Vivian since she was a young woman of 80. So <laughs> a long, long time. So happy birthday, Vivian. So as we begin our worship service this morning, Pastor George is going to come and lead us, Pastor George. Come ye thankful people, come. Let's sing it together. Shall we stand to sing, please? Come ye thankful people, come read the song of harvest home all this safely gathered in. God, our Maker, doth provide for our wants to be supplied. Come to God's own temple, come, raise the song of harvest home. 
We ourselves are God's own field, fruit unto his praise to yield, weed and tares together sown, unto joy or sorrow grown. First the blade and then the ear, then the foghorn shall appear, Lord of harvest grant that we wholesome grain and pure may be. For the Lord our God shall come and shall take his harvest home. From his field shall purge away all that doth offend that day. Give his angels charge at last in the fire the tears are cast. But the fruitful air to store in his garden evermore. Even so, Lord, quickly come, bring thy final harvest home. Gather thou thy people in, free from sorrow, free from sin. There forever purify in thy presence to abide. Come with all thine angels, come, praise the sun, the harvest home. Amen. Be seated. Psalm 100 says, serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. We are so blessed and so privileged to have the opportunity to do just that together today. To God be the glory. Would you pray with me? Father, we realize that we could never give thanks too much. We could never praise you too much. In fact, we will have all of eternity to do so because you are worthy of that much praise. You are worthy of eternal thanksgiving, adoration, and so this morning, Lord, we rejoice in the opportunity that we have to give praise now, to offer thanksgiving now for who you are and for what you have done. To you be all the glory, all the praise. We're reminded of Psalm 115.1, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. Father, we have so much for which to be thankful, and we do give thanks today. We rejoice in your gracious provision in our lives and in our church family. Most of all, Father, we give praise and thanksgiving for who you are, for no matter what our circumstances may be like from day to day, you are ever the same, unchanging. We give thanks for the attributes that are made so clear to us in Scripture, your holiness, your greatness, your goodness, your love, your mercy, your grace, your justice. Thank you, Father, for being our loving, tender shepherd and meeting our needs and promising to take care of us no matter what happens in this nation, no matter what happens in the world. Thank you for who you are. We rejoice together, and I pray that you will continue to guide us in our worship. Oh, Father, guide us in the study of your word as it is proclaimed this morning. And when all is said and done, 
may you get the credit for every good thing that happens, every life touched and changed. May you receive the honor and the glory in Christ's holy name. Amen. How can I say thanks? How can I say thanks for the things you have done for me? Things so undeserved, yet you give to prove your love for me. The voices of a million angels could not express my gratitude, all that I am and ever hope to be. I owe it all to thee, to God be the glory, to God be the glory, to God. Should I gain any praise, let it go to Calvary. With his blood, he has saved me. With his power, he has raised me. To God be the glory for the pain. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. This is the primary reason we give thanks to him, right? Because he has saved us and called us. Let's sing it together, this course. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Salvation so rich and free. Let's sing it again. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you. Missionary David Livingston once said, I place no value on anything I have or may possess except in relation to the kingdom of God. If anything will advance the interest of the kingdom, it shall be given away or kept only as by giving or keeping it, I shall most promote the glory of him to whom I owe all my hopes in time or 
eternity. That's quite a statement, isn't it? I was struck by his conviction on possessions. He's saying that whether he gives it or keeps it is dependent on what will most glorify God. That's a great principle for us to live by. And that's what biblical stewardship looks like, advancing the interest of the kingdom of God. My desire and my prayer is that God will use each of us for his purposes so that his kingdom will be advanced on this earth and all for his glory and for the saving of precious souls around the world. God bless you greatly as you continue to give for those biblical purposes. By the way, you may have noticed that our offering plates are inside the worship center right back here, just off the foyer. Someone made the observation that the offering plates when they were out in the foyer were hard to see, hard to find. So we don't want to be a church where you can't find the offering plate. So <laughs> I think this will work out really, really well. Pastor Don is going to come and lead us as we dedicate our tithes and our offerings to the Lord. Besides that, they're also on the outside of the door, but you can't miss them. I think that's a good idea. Isn't it wonderful? You know, during this Thanksgiving time, with all this going on, I just couldn't stop thanking the Lord for all his blessings. We stop to count your blessings. We forget all the other things. God is wonderful, and we serve a great God. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time to be here to give back to thee what you have given us, a portion of it. Lord, we, we thank you for the giving of these people, for the church, for missions. Lord, souls being won around the world because of their faithfulness. Lord, we praise you for that. And we pray a special blessing upon each one of them as they give to you. Lord, we pray for the service to as it follows, Lord, in the message. Lord, bless the pastor as he preaches this morning. Fill him with thy spirit. And Lord, open our hearts and our minds to be prepared and to be ready to accept all that we hear and allow the Holy Spirit to work it within our life. A time of praise, thanks of thanksgiving. We have so much to be thankful for. Praise the Lord. In your most holy name, amen.
I want you to mark uh, December 24th on your calendar at 3 p.m. Joel is going to be playing a Christmas concert for us, and we're going to have a carol sing here at 3 o'clock on Christmas Eve. Remember that, okay? We'll look forward to it. Thank you, Joel. Number, oh, you don't need the number. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. Amen. second verse together. Uh... together. Are we weak and heavy laden, covered with a load of care? Precious Savior, still our rest. to the Lord in Let me ask you this morning to turn your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And we're going to look at a few powerful and exciting and challenging verses in God's Word as we talk about how to measure our lives. 1 Thessalonians Chapter 5, I'll begin reading with verse 16, and if you like, you may stand with me for the reading of God's Word this morning. The Bible says, beginning in verse 16, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. And then he says in the next verse, and this is really a benediction, isn't it? Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. 
And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Would you pray with me? Father, we acknowledge that this is one of your amazing promises in your word, and we give thanks. I pray that in the remaining time we have together this morning, that you will open our hearts and open our minds to the truth of your living, life-transforming word. Oh, Father, be our teacher, I pray, in the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Now, you may notice that in verses 16 through 18, there are three specific commands. Three specific commands in this challenging passage of Scripture. What are they? Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. These commands are actually in a plural form in their original language, so they apply to the whole church, both as individuals and as a body of believers. To ignore these commands is to open ourselves up to years of misery, years of misery. On the other hand, to practice them, to really Practice them is to know victorious Christian living beyond anything we could ever imagine. Suppose someone asked me, Pastor, how can I determine God's will for my life? Most pastors get questions like that from time to time. How can I really know God's will for my life? I think one of the best things I could do when asked a question of that nature is to point them to the very passage we're considering this morning and tell them three specific things that they can do now, right? Now, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in every circumstance give thanks. And the reason I believe this would be a good answer to such a question is because the last part of verse 18 says, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And so if we're doing these things on a consistent basis, then we are well on our way for determining God's specific plans for us in other areas of our lives. You see, it's, it's really a choice that we make. And that choice is not dependent on circumstances and situations. You can choose to rejoice always. You can choose to pray constantly. You can choose to give thanks in all circumstances of life. So let's focus on each of these. First of all, choose to rejoice always. In fact, you can't read the Bible without seeing that God wants His people to be joyful. Pastor John Piper says, God is not a killjoy. He just opposes what kills joy. That's exactly right. God wants his people to choose joy. Nehemiah said, the joy of the Lord is my strength. But can you rejoice all the time? I mean, did Nehemiah and the Apostle Paul really understand our modern-day pressures? Would Paul have said rejoice always if he lived in the 21st century? What about the year 2020? Would he have rejoiced in the midst of a global pandemic? Would he have said those words if he had lived in our day of terrorism, immorality, gender confusion, governmental corruption, and a political movement towards socialism and Marxism? The answer is, yes, of course he would rejoice. Of course he would have still said those words, rejoice, what? 
always. Because as I mentioned a moment ago, our choosing to rejoice is not dependent on circumstances. Furthermore, Paul did understand what it meant to live in a day of immorality, governmental corruption, terrorism, persecution, and the like. In fact, he used to be a terrorist before his conversion to Christ. So no matter what the circumstances are like, joy is always appropriate for the believer. It is always the proper response. In fact, we are commanded to do it. We are commanded to rejoice. Philippians 4.4 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always again, I will say rejoice. And so there's a tremendous emphasis here on joy and on our choosing to rejoice. Actually, the Greek word that is used here means be glad, leap with joy, sing aloud. Now, when did you last leap for joy? Well, perhaps we don't have to physically leap for joy. You know, I'm not the leaper I used to be. Now that I'm 60-something. But we should be leaping in our hearts. Am I right? This is the teaching of Scripture. We should be leaping for joy in our hearts. We should be singing aloud. We should be glad all our days because of our being in Christ, being an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ because of all of the gifts He has lavished upon us. Oh, we should be glad. We should be Leaping for joy. We should be singing aloud. Proverbs 15 verse 13 says, A glad heart makes a cheerful face, but by sorrow of heart the spirit is crushed. So based on this truth, if there's joy in your heart, it will show on your face. Some people, as you know, choose to complain all the time, but believers should choose to rejoice all the time. A person might say, but you know, pastor so-and-so really disappointed me. Well, did Jesus disappoint you? Of course not. It's been said, if being hurt by the church causes you to lose faith in God, then your faith was in people, not God. Yes, our faith is to be in Him, and our joy is to be in Him as well. As the Apostle Peter puts it, I love this verse. You rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Did you realize that only the believer can do that? You rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. My, what a stunning picture Peter gives us here of true joy. It is joy inexpressible, filled with glory. How can we not rejoice as believers? We have been forgiven of all our sins, and we have much more than that, but that alone should cause overflowing joy. Psalm 103, for example, says, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. As far as the east is from the west. By the way, how far is that? You can't measure it. As far as the east is from the west, so far does He remove our transgressions from us. Oh, what grace, what love, what mercy God has lavished upon His people. We should rejoice that our names are written in heaven. That's what Jesus said to His disciples on one occasion. You know, they had returned one day so excited that even the demons were subject to them in Jesus' name. 
I can just see them coming back to their master and with great excitement saying, why, Lord, even the demons had to flee when we proclaimed Your name to those who were possessed of the devil. Even the demons had to go. Jesus, notice this, Jesus acknowledged the power that He had given to His disciples, but notice what He said. Here's how He responded. Nevertheless, He said to them, Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Now that's something to leap for joy over. We are forever secure in Christ. Ah, oh, but pastor, what if this happens? What if that happens? What if the world blows up? I know where I'll be. We are forever secure in Christ. Spurgeon said, the sovereignty of God is the sweet pillow upon which I rest my head every night. What's he saying? The fact that God is in charge. The fact that He has always been in charge and always will be in charge is a comfort to us in a world gone mad. I think my earphone is falling off my ear. As long as my ear doesn't fall off, that would be bad. Let's see if I can tighten it without breaking an ear bone. There we go. That could be a signal for me to stop the sermon, but I don't, I don't think so. How do we keep joy strong in our lives? That might be a good question to ask. How do we keep it strong in our lives? Well, the psalmist prayed in Psalm 16, verse 11, in your presence there is fullness of joy. So the more time we spend in God's presence, the more time we spend communing with Him, the greater will be our joy. And the more time we spend in God's Word, studying, meditating upon it, the greater will be what? Our joy. How do we know that? Well, for one thing, the prophet says in Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 16, your words were found and I ate them. And your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart. Time in prayer, time in the Word, walking with God daily. Through prayer, we speak to Him. Through the Word, He speaks to us. What a privilege to have that kind of communion on an ongoing basis. I would also point out that fellowship with other believers helps keep joy strong in our lives. That's so true, isn't it? The Apostle Paul wrote to the Philippians in chapter 4, verse 1, Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. You see, Paul knew there was joy in fellowship with other believers. He longed to be with them. Now, I know that fellowship is a little more challenging during these days because of the pandemic, but it is so important to look for ways to stay in touch with other believers. For one thing, Satan tries to isolate this is really true, isn't it? Think about this. He tries to isolate a Christian so that he or she will become discouraged and will despair and will begin to feel that efforts are wasted and life has become useless. Well, obviously, there's no joy in that. But when we stay connected in a Bible-centered fellowship of believers we find much encouragement, instruction, and joy. For example, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13 says, But encourage each other daily while it is still called today, so that none of you is hardened by sin's deception. You see, fellowshipping with other believers is not just a nice thing to do. 
It is indispensable to our survival. And there's joy in fellowship. Joy in fellowship. Now, biblically, fellowship is not when a couple believers get together and talk about politics or talk about ball games or talk about the weather. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. But socializing is not the same as biblical fellowship, is it? Fellowship has more to do with believers declaring to one another what God is doing in their lives. Prayers that are being answered. Opportunities to proclaim the good news of the gospel to others. Fellowship is when we rejoice with one another in the greatness and the goodness of God Himself. What a joy that brings to our hearts. How, how built up, how encouraged we become through fellowshipping with one another. You know, you can have medicine in the cabinet, but you must take it for it to do you any good. Well, the Bible says in Proverbs 17, 22, a joyful heart is good medicine. And so we take God's life-giving medicine by choosing to rejoice always. Secondly, I want you to notice this with me. We choose to pray without ceasing. You see, joyful believers will also be prayerful believers. Now, to pray without ceasing does not mean to simply pray repetitiously, something that Jesus warned against in Matthew 6. But rather, it means we pray regularly, persistently. It's a way of life, actually, that is marked by a continual attitude of prayer. You could say that it is the development of a Godward look. So that at every opportunity, our hearts go out to God. The channel of communication with Him stays open. But to be in a constant attitude of prayer, we must have regular times of prayer. Regular times of prayer. Specific times when we determine to get along with God. The son of missionary Hudson Taylor said this about his father. For 40 years, the son never rose on China that God didn't find him on his knees. Needless to say, Hudson Taylor had a great, great burden for the people God had called him to serve. You know, people measure the effectiveness of their lives in different ways. But the way we measure effectiveness is often very different from the way God measures effectiveness. Writer Wesley Duell has said, measure your life. Listen to his words. Measure your life by the extent to which you put other things aside in order to make time for prayer. Measure your life by your hunger to be alone with God in prayer. Measure your life by the extent to which all your life is filled with prayer and you pray without ceasing. I believe he's right. This is the way we should measure our lives. And so how would you define prayer? I would define it by saying that it is simply communication with God. Spending time in His presence. Speaking to Him from your heart. Speaking honestly, openly, revealing your heart. He already knows, but He likes it when we come before Him with our burdens, our concerns, also our joys and our thanksgivings. And not only does prayer involve speaking to God, it also involves listening. Listening. And as you know, prayer takes different forms. There's confession, <clears throat> there's praise, there's petition, which is bringing our request to God. There is intercession, which means praying for others. 
And then there's giving thanks, which brings us to the third command in our text. Verse 18, choose to give thanks in all circumstances. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and now give thanks in all circumstances. Giving thanks is a strong emphasis in Scripture, a very strong emphasis. I love the fact that we have a day set aside in our nation known as Thanksgiving. But we must also give thanks at all times and in all circumstances. Now, the ability to give thanks is not related to economics or material affluence or success in our work. No, it has to do with people and their God. You see, one of the great benefits of giving thanks in everything is that it keeps our focus on God and off ourselves. And because of who God is and what He has done, He is worthy of our praise and our thanksgiving, whether we feel like praising Him or not, whether we feel like thanking Him or not. The fact is, we are not commanded to feel grateful. No, feelings come and go, and they are often very unreliable indicators of the true condition of things. Therefore, as someone has said, when you don't feel like thanking God, thank God until you feel like thanking God, and thank God some more. So giving thanks, as we can see clearly in Scripture, is an act of the will. We choose to give thanks. Not just in the good things, but in everything that occurs in life. No matter the trials, the times of testing, or the unexpected circumstances, believers are to give thanks. You know, we don't have much difficulty giving thanks when all is going well. But what about when things go wrong? when health breaks down, or finances go awry, or unexpected trials come along, do we give thanks then? After describing trials and persecutions in his own life and ministry, the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 12, so death is at work in us, but life in you. Now, that's quite a statement, isn't it? What does it mean? Well, Paul himself, as you know, suffered much hardship. But the result of his ministry, get this now, the result of his ministry, out of all of that suffering, persecution, hardship, the result of his ministry was life, spiritual life for others. He goes on to say, for it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. Think about that carefully for just a moment. All that comes our way, and I mean all that comes our way, is intended by God for His glory our good, and the good of others. So you don't have to just grin and bear it. You can give thanks. Knowing that the end result of the worst situation will be God's glory and the good of His people. That really does give us a different perspective, doesn't it? We are free to see difficulties as part of a larger purpose. I think about the experience of the great Bible teacher and commentator, Matthew Henry, who I believe lived in the 17th century. He was robbed one day. And, and out of that experience, he found three things for which to be thankful. He wrote these words in his journal. I am grateful that he took just my wallet and not my life. I am thankful that even though he took all I had, that wasn't much. I am thankful that I was the one who was robbed and not the robber. 
three things out of that experience. Can you think of times of difficulty and perhaps unexpected adversity in your own life out of which came benefit, out of which came blessing, out of which came a greater awareness of gratitude. And think about this. Giving thanks in the midst of suffering or great difficulty is a radical kind of gratitude that is a powerful witness to our neighbors that God's power and presence are real no matter the circumstances of life. People with this kind of gratitude are overflowing with what C.S. Lewis called the good infection. Now that word usually indicates a problem, right? At least from a medical standpoint, and especially during days of a pandemic. But when our thankfulness infects others by pointing them to God himself, well, that's a good infection. And as believers, we rejoice continually in what God has done in our lives. Not what we have done. Many people, however, believe the lie that they are the ones responsible for all that they have in their lives. But we know different, don't we? We know different. We who have been redeemed from our sins by the precious and all-sufficient blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and adopted into the family of God have reason to rejoice always. We have reason to pray without ceasing. We have reason to give thanks in every circumstance of life. And as we develop the habit of gratitude, we are constantly asking two questions. For what should I be grateful and to whom should I be grateful? Have you ever wondered how atheists celebrate Thanksgiving? Do they just give thanks to whom it may concern? I mean, just a vague, generalized gratitude? Oh, they may give thanks to people for this, that, and the other. But that was not the idea behind the establishing of our National Day of Thanksgiving. <clears throat> we give thanks to God, our Creator, Sustainer, Redeemer. And when we see afresh how much we owe thankfulness to God, it helps to reduce our own self-centeredness and sense of self-importance, doesn't it? For all good things, all good things come from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And of course, the very pinnacle of his gifts would be our eternal salvation through Jesus, our Lord. Scottish pastor Robert Murray McShane once wrote these words in the 19th century. When this passing world is done, when has sunk yon glaring sun, when we stand with Christ in glory, looking o'er life's finished story, then, Lord, shall I fully know, not till then, how much I owe. When I stand before the throne, dressed in beauty, not my own, when I see thee as thou art, love thee with unsinning heart, then, Lord, shall I fully know, not till then, how much I owe. Chosen not for good in me, wakened up from wrath to flee, hidden in the Savior's side, by the Spirit sanctified, teach me, Lord, on earth to show by my love how much I owe. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in every circumstance. This is how we measure our lives. And may our lives every day be pleasing to Him, honoring to Him, bring glory to Him, and used by Him to make a difference in this world.
have this thought. Oh, I wish this was the 1950s. You know, life was so simple and easy going back in the good old days. We are alive today because the God of this universe who created all things and has perfect knowledge and understanding ordained that we would be alive in this day. Do I like everything that is going on in this day? Are you kidding me? Of course not. But what a great day to be alive and reflect the light of Jesus, the glory of the Gospel. What a day to be alive to proclaim the only message that will change a person's life for time and eternity. What a day to be alive to dispense the only medicine that works. And that's the medicine of God's truth, the medicine of the Gospel that changes a person's heart and mind and life. What a day to be alive. Praise His name. And I want to stay alive as long as I live. That's an original quote from Mark Drake. Don't you? I want to stay alive as long as I am alive on this earth. I will live forever, so will you if you know Christ. But we're here for a reason. Oh, we are here for a reason. God has not finished with us. Our missionary in residence to the Renaissance is 99 years old. And God is using her. He is using others in this church family and throughout this community, no matter our age. He has not called us home for a reason. He has a purpose. Give Him praise for who He is and what He is doing in our lives now in the year 2020. Sometimes people say, oh, I can't wait until 2020 is over. As though on January 1st, 2021, it all goes away. I hope so. But there's no guarantee that going from one day to the next, one year to the next, is going to change anything. I'll tell you what changes everything. Here's what changes everything in us. You ready? You've heard it before. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in every circumstance. Let's do that. Let's do that every day. Would you pray with me? Father, I am not able to do these things except you empower me through the Spirit to do these things. None of us can do these things except the Spirit of God empower us. But we are so glad that the Holy Spirit desires to empower us to rejoice always, to pray without ceasing, and to give thanks in every circumstance of life. Oh, dear Father, to you be all praise. We rejoice in our Lord Jesus Christ, King of kings, Lord of lords, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing in a moment. Rejoice, the Lord is King. I think that's what we're singing, right? What a great hymn to sing, a hymn of praise. Let's practice now. Let's practice. You're the choir. Everyone here. Let's practice what we've just seen in God's Word about singing aloud, being glad, rejoicing always, praising Him with the whole heart. Rejoice. The Lord is King. Hallelujah. May we stand. May we sing. Yeah.
rejoice, O Lord is King, your Lord and King of glory. Rejoice, give thanks and sing, and triumph evermore. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say rejoice. Jesus, so save your reign, the God of truth and love. When he had purged our stains, he took his seat above. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say rejoice. His kingdom cannot fail, he rules o'er earth and hell. The keys of death and hell are to our Jesus' gift. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say, In glorious home, our Lord and Judge shall come and take his servants up to their eternal home. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again. I say, rejoice. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Amen. Have a wonderful afternoon. Enjoy the beautiful weather that God has given to us. Let me say a quick word about uh, the increase in the number of cases. We, We want to continue to be as alert as we possibly can. I know Uh, Some churches are just giving reminders to folks in their in-person services, um, such as it's good not to congregate inside, but rather to fellowship more once you get outside the building. I'm told that uh, the chances for uh, contracting the virus are much, much less, I think, about 20 times less outside when you're talking with one another rather than than inside. So uh, you might want to keep that in mind if you would, but I I am so appreciative of your cooperation with uh, all that we've asked over these months. We, We do look forward to the day when this thing will be behind us, but right now God has his purposes, and if it brings about Um, an awakening in our nation, a spiritual awakening, it will be worth every moment of it, won't it? If it wakes people up to the reality of God and His plan for their lives, then we say, thank you, Father. Thank you. So, God bless you. If I can assist in any way, I'll be right down here at the front with my shield on. So, God bless you. Go in the peace of the Lord, rejoice in Him, you're dismissed.